Hey, hi everybody. Uh, today we're going to be going, talking about an introduction to VX, or as I like to call it, how to write a virus without getting on the news. I haven't given a talk in a while here. My name is Michael. I'm a fourth year here at RIT. I enjoy, I'm a red and black team enjoyer. Professionally, I'm, uh, I'm inter interested in red team and the security and software engineering side. I also like uh, free and open source software and all that. Um, if you like Linux or anything related to that, uh, the Linux users group at RIT meets at 4.30 on Fridays. So we're actually up in the second floor and we are always open to presentations. So we, we like the folks here and the folks here like us. So always looking for, for some collaboration on that. Where's an A? There you go. All righty. So some definitions. Uh, so virus, the, we're gonna use the AV definition here. It's a program that infects other programs or a program with a personality. Uh, it's a little bit distinct from a worm which infects systems. So you can have a program that's both, but that's the distinction there. And VX stands for virus exchange. Uh, people writing viruses on the internet. They actually have a pretty interesting history. Uh, there's this guy, you might learn about him in 380, briefly. This guy named John von Neumann, he gave a lecture about self-reproducing -re automata. A lot of different interpretations of that, but one of them was a self-replicating program. And it actually got published uh, after he died. That's him and his machine. One of the first ones, uh, this is actually a worm as well, but this is the creeper uh, virus, which was on the ARPANET back in the day. It was a big deal at the time. Uh, it took up a lot of resources. They had to write the Reaper program to take rid of it, but um, interesting idea. Sort of the first real implementation of this uh, concept. We got some PC viruses. This one's called Brain. Uh, it was a, one of the first PC viruses, and it was also uh, copy protection for heart monitoring software, apparently. Two guys that wrote it actually signed it, and they run one of the largest ISPs in Pakistan, apparently. There's a mini doc about him from F-Secure with Miko Hipponen. So if you want to watch that, it's on YouTube. I got a DOS virus here called Mars. Looks pretty cool. That's about it. Um, yeah, so creative viruses. Not exactly consensual, but it is creative. Uh, this is a fun one that I like. Um, so this game came out a little while ago. It was a Dreamcast game. I don't know what it's about. Um, but the fun thing about console games is they often came with extras that you get when you plug it into your computer. And one of those extras, in addition to like wallpapers and other stuff like that, is a screensaver. If you're not familiar on Windows, screensavers are like uh, executable programs. They're like PE files. So some genius at Microsoft came up with that idea. And uh, yeah, it had a virus on it, so that was a problem. And they had to link to Symantec, and it was a PR nightmare. And if that was bad, this one's worse. Um, who's seen War Games? Raise your hand. Great film. Uh, video game, not so great. Uh, if you played Command and Conquer, apparently you've played this one. And it also came with a virus, so that wasn't cool. Um, <laughs> and uh, yeah, everybody got it. And apparently the developer probably picked it up from a PC gamer's disc. So yeah, this is how viruses spread. It was especially bad then. If you want to write your own virus, we're going to do that today. It's basically three parts. You got your infector, your payload, and then an optional trigger for that. You really only need the first one, your infector. That's what makes it a virus. So it actually spreads its code through different. Ooh. Turtle. Turtle. Hey, stop doing your homework. What is going on? <laughs> Interesting. Anyway, yeah. So infectors, that's what makes it a virus. And you don't even need a payload. If it spreads on its own, it's a virus. So. Think about that. So our infector is going to be written like this, uh, hunched over your monitor like so. We're going to search for your files here. We're going to grab our virus code, and then we're going to actually prepare and inject it into some file. So pretty cool. We're going to be writing an ELF executable today, uh, or an ELF infector, rather, uh, in assembly. So if you're not familiar with ELF, that's what runs on your Linux system or on your Wii, your phone sometimes. It's an executable and linkable format. You use it for programs and libraries and all that. It holds code and data and basically tells your OS how to load it. So just a standard, and it runs on all those things. You can write two kinds, basically, of viruses. The one on the left is the, the big imp. 
That's a high level program. So you basically take your virus program and you append the legit one to the bottom. You run your virus code and then you execute the virus right afterwards. We're gonna do the one on the right here. It's a little bit smaller imp, but uh, it's just appended straight to the bottom. So you trick the code into executing yours. So our infector uh, is pretty, pretty simple. It's these three steps. We're gonna get all the files with directory entries. Uh, we're gonna actually grab our code. We got a little trick for that. And then our preparation is like a four step thing. There's this thing called a program header. It defines what gets loaded. So this is what actually takes your code from your disk into your memory. And then it's looking for code to load, so you have to actually add it there. That's the second step. And then you update the entry point, so it actually goes to your code instead of the legit program. And if you wanna keep up appearances, you should probably run the original program too, so that's the last step. So basically, this is how you open a directory uh, with some kind of bad assembly code. This is not a clean code presentation but uh, we're gonna be doing some, some syscalls here, opening it up. 2E is a period, so we're gonna open all the files in our current directory. And then on the right, that's like a simple get started exit program right there. I have some little junk code stuff in here, so this really messes with some bad disassemblers. So if you uh, put that in there, you jump get files plus four, you get over the, the junk code. Fun, better for your debugger than your disassembler there. And then basically, we get some space on our stack and we just call get dense. So if you've never done assembly, uh, this might look like a foreign language, kinda is, but just know that we're making some, some very basic calls here. All we're doing is we're getting a list of things and we're saving it uh, to where, where it says durance, that's where we're saving it. And then at the end, we're gonna save how many entries we have, just for, for later use. We're gonna loop over all those files, so a big loop. Uh, we're gonna open them all, just like before. And then if it works, we're gonna go to the next uh, step, basically. We're gonna save that bottom line right there, RAX, that's our return. And we're gonna save it into R12. Promise it's not all code from here, guys, really. But once you've opened it, you do some basic checks. We wanna make sure it's an ELF file. We're gonna do 64-bit, because if you do both, you have to write both. And 32-bit's not getting any younger, so we're gonna stick with that. And then we're also gonna do this thing where we check for a little identifier so that we don't infect the same file twice. Because if you do that, that can really get hairy. So we're not gonna do that. And I mentioned this thing called a program header. So it just defines what gets loaded. Um, your programs already have one of these, just tells it where to load our stuff. But we're gonna add one for our virus code because it's not supposed to be there. So we have to make one ourselves. But it's real easy. There's a lot of different techniques, but the easiest one is what's called the note to load or PT note to PT load infection technique. Basically, your note segment, it's not actually loaded, it just holds metadata. So we can use it as a loader. And if uh, you do that, you basically just change the type, load whatever you want, and uh, you're good to go. Because these note segments aren't actually used, and there's nothing that you really lose from, from replacing it. There's one big exception, one big problem, and that's our gopher friends. Uh, this will not work on go binaries, so just write all your stuff and go, and you won't have any problems, I guess. At least with this one. And it's real simple. You basically, uh, we do a final error check here. Um, I figured this out, that go has a little identifier, so we just check for it. It's at offset 12 inside that little structure there. And we basically replace the type with load. We're gonna do read, write, execute permissions uh, because we wanna do some fun stuff later. And then the alignment is, um, just has to be modulo something. It's in the documentation, I don't remember. Once we have all our code added, that happened before this, we're gonna actually update a file so that we change the entry point. So we got our E entry over there, we're gonna save it, and then we're gonna basically, the V address is where it gets loaded. So wherever we told it to load our code, that's where our code is. And we're gonna jump there, and we're gonna have a fun time. Now you might be asking, how do you find your own code, right? It's not exactly immediately obvious. Um, when I was doing this whole virus thing, I was like, kind of seemed really confusing. It's not like recursion, but it's kind of confusing in the same way. So I had no idea like how you even do that. But the cool thing about a von Neumann architecture is that code is just data, and so we're just gonna kind of treat it like that. So imagine we go back to our example here. On the left, we have an infected file. 
And on the right, we have our magic baby virus that has not infected anything. And so, you know, where it's loaded in memory might be different, right? It might have a big program, a small program. It might be at a different address. But the thing about viruses is it's all relative. So we're going to use some offsets here. We're going to keep track of our little label here, my label. And we know it's 10, uh, hex 10, 16 bytes away from the start of the program. So if we can figure out where that label is, then we can do some subtraction and just figure out where we started out. And so we have this little trick right here. Uh, it's called the call pop trick. So this one's a favorite of antivirus companies because I cracked down on this one pretty easily. But you basically call this little thing. And the call instruction, if you've never done assembly, it just takes that address of delta and pushes it onto the stack. Um, well, actually, it jumps there and then pushes the next instruction onto the stack. The same thing in this case. And so we pop it immediately into RBP. That's our current, basically our current address. And you subtract where you started from to get to the start of the code. Uh, you only have to do this once. Um, I don't want to do this every time I have to do stuff, so I just saved it on my little virus stack there. Cool thing about this virus that I wanted to get going is polymorphism. So you can imagine if you infect a bunch of files with the same code, you'll have the same signature. And your antivirus vendor will be very happy because they'll just be able to get that signature, and then you're, you're kind of donezo. So the idea with polymorphism is you basically just encrypt the code with a different key every time. So every single infection, it looks a little bit different than the previous one. And it is different uh, on disk. And that process is pretty easy. Uh, a lot of people are a little wary of this RD RAND instruction up here. They say it has a backdoor in it. Um, I think it's good enough for what we're doing here, even in the worst case, so that's what I used. We just changed some instructions and some junk code that we don't even run anyways, and we set a new key. And then we just loop over the code and, uh, and XOR it. So this is what we do right before we actually infect uh, the file. We change our code, and then we append it to the end. And the cool thing is that because all this is relative, I know where the key is located. I can just change it right there. And then when the infected program runs it, it will decrypt itself. So I'm going to jump to a quick demo here. We're going to see how well I can do this with one hand. Big clip. Oh, here we go. Yeah, someone help me. Help me. You got it now. Oh, clammy, guys. Yeah, you know, we could do a little bigger, right? I don't want to make you guys squint uncomfortable here. All right, so I have a little Docker container in here. Um, never run it on your host. That's a red team choke right there. So we're going to compile our thing. It's got all this stuff in here. It puts all our stuff in the bin directory. So I got a bunch of binaries here that we're going to infect. Oh, we got a go binary. I got a copy ls. I got a position independent binary, so like ASLR and all that. Basically means it can load it at any address. Pretty nifty. Kind of a test of our offsets here. And I'm also going to run a Rust binary someday. That's a Rust binary right there. And then we also have a statically compiled one just for completeness, really. So we can imagine a scenario where an attacker has taken their virus of choice and maybe a program as well. And they've, uh, they've chosen to infect it, right? We'll go to our temp. Got two little files here. I'm going to run our virus right here. Ooh, important thing here. We're going to pipe our output. We'll save that. So right now, uh, we have not infected this file. And I can verify that by checking that our magic identifier is not present. So I'm going to quickly run our little virus here. And it's going to infect this file with all the fun stuff. And so if we check for it, we have our magic identifier here. OK. All righty. So we'll copy this back. Our attacker is back on our box. Ooh. Did I do this wrong? No, we're good. All righty. So we got all our programs here. Finally, 
let's say somebody has copied our War Games copy, right? Or our favorite video game, or our uh, completely legal, whatever program you're downloading, reverse engineering software. Um, we all have that one cousin, right? Anyway, so we have our little uh, our program here. I'm going to run it, and we're going to see if our virus works. So you have a picture of an average blue teamer right here. <laughs> and it looks like it's worked. Pretty cool, right? So let's see our other programs. How'd they do? Uh-oh. Maybe the static one? No. I think LS will be good, right? It came with our computer. That didn't work either. So if we do a little, you know, little bash thing. Do you remember my bash things? Yeah. They're all infected. <laughs> There's only one exception, and that's our go binary. There we go. And our virus, because I didn't put it in there. But the virus doesn't infect itself because it gives an error, and uh, that's cool. If you do error checking, you don't have to worry about that. And that's pretty much, uh, pretty much my demo. So I got some resources. One sec. If you are looking for resources about this stuff, you should really check out this e-zine. And e-zines in general, they're all nice. This one came out really recently, in April, actually. Um, this is about a week before I wrote this. And uh, yeah, they do all sorts of ELF stuff, like viruses and reverse engineering. Has some LKM stuff, interesting little loaders and all that. Anything to do with ELF. And then there's another zine. Yeah, so if you've never heard of an LKM, it's basically a kernel module. So your OS has a kernel. And you can put little malware in there, or whatever you want, and it'll load it into the kernel. So you can bypass a whole bunch of cool stuff. That's a whole other talk. And one last e-zine is paged out. It's a one-page article zine. Everything has to be one page or less. So you get a ton of articles when you get an issue of this. Anything security related, and if you're a fan of like Ginvale um, and that sort of side of the house, definitely a really cool resource. I'm going to open things up to questions. Jake. When are we getting the Windows equivalent? If you want to write a PE virus, uh, we, can, we can figure that out. The cool thing about writing viruses is that you can do it whenever. You can do it in Python, PHP. PHP is a really good one. Um, Danny in the back. That's a blue team job. Uh, 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 you can do a couple things. Uh, so you have to like remove the code and then fix the header and all that. Um, that's the best way. Yeah. The really best way, though, is just to reinstall. If you have a virus, you don't know what it's doing. A real virus will not insult you like that, probably. Um, so you have to do like integrity checking and all that stuff. Uh, you know, ounce of prevention is better than a pound of cure. So definitely the way to go with this stuff. And the full code is on GitHub. We all good? <laughs>